How y'all doing today? Um, very excited that Gregory asked me to do this, although a little bit nervous, but um, hopefully this information won't be entirely boring to you. Uh, I understand you learned some stuff about artist catering last week or whatnot with Virginia, and I'm sure that was probably a lot more exciting and interesting than this. But anyway, um, a lot of information, and certainly if you have any questions or anything to interject, just please let me know. Uh, I have been involved in security management for about 13 years, and before that, another seven years dealing with um, festival production, and I've known Gregory for a good portion of that. I'm the operations director at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, as well as Essence Music Festival, and the company I work with produces a lot of other events, smaller than that, bigger, you know, one-time concerts, that sort of thing, so I've been involved in a lot of different uh, types of, of events. I also work with a private security company that provides staffing for uh, lots of venues in town as well as the Superdome, uh, NFL events. Uh, we did LSU this year um, and uh, so that's a little bit different perspective but uh, still all security related. Um, I don't really have any formal education in security and I got sort of into it purely by accident in the production world. Uh, to me it just takes a lot of common sense and a knowledge of, of the events that you're doing. So and that's what happened to me. I had a, a knowledge of the Jazz Festival and uh, I just sort of happened on it uh, accident, accidentally and people started asking me, well, you know, what, do you th what would you do? And then the next thing you knew, I was the security director. So Essence came along and I took over that role there. Um, a little bit different, it's held in the Superdome as opposed to an outdoor event. But again, common sense, you can apply the things that you've, that you've learned uh, to any type of event or situation. Um, there, are, there, there aren't a whole lot, or there weren't a whole lot, when I was uh, getting started, classes like this uh, and curriculum that you could study these things. So it was just a matter of learning from your peers and uh, getting as much information as you could. There are some organization, good organizations out there like International Assembly Managers Association. They have a lot of information on their website and they, help, they hold conferences and seminars uh, as it relates to managing venues. Uh, I went to a, a conference recently and there were people there from all the major sporting venues, a lot of universities, uh, people who manage uh, the sporting uh, venues and entertainment venues on universities, which has uh, gotten to be a bigger and bigger job, as well as uh, tour management people, that sort of thing. So it covers a wide scope. As far as the practical aspects of the sort of security stuff that I do, such as figuring out how much security I need for a venue or for an event, again, uh, it comes with experience. There's no basic, there's no formula that you can apply to it. Um, you just have to know something about uh, uh, the different aspects of the event and, and figure out what to do. You might be dealing with you know, a very small venue, a few people, or you might be dealing with something like at the Superdome Essence where there may be 55,000 people uh, at an event or Jazz Fest where there could be 100,000 people uh, at an event at any, at any given time. Flexibility is also really important. Things change constantly with security and you have to be uh, flexible and again use your knowledge and your experience to uh, fix and do whatever you have to do to make things work. So what is security exactly? Uh, definition would be freedom from danger and risk, safety, freedom from anxiety or doubt, well-founded confidence, uh, something that secures or makes safe, protects and defends, precautions taken to guard against crime, attack, sabotage, espionage, things like that. Uh, and it's an assurance, it's a, it's a guarantee. So let's talk about some of the, th uh, first of all, different security entities that you would be dealing with. And this, um, in Louisiana, this is going to apply and it's going to be probably similar anywhere you go. Um, first of all, you've got law enforcement. Here in New Orleans, we got the New Orleans Police Department, or you might be dealing with the Sheriff's Department or state troopers, something like that. Um, you also have in-house security or proprietary security, and that is security, uh, basically a venue's own staff who they have put in charge of security or given that task to. 
and then you might be dealing with private security. And very similar to in-house security, uh, private security would be provided by a licensed company. Um, private security in Louisiana is regulated by a state board and they um, have certain criteria that companies providing security have to follow um, and they also have certain criteria for people who want to be private security guards. Uh, you have unarmed people and you have armed people. There's a certain amount of training that, you, that those people have to go through and they get certified by the state and basically that just says that they have um, uh, followed all of the rules and regulations, they have gone through the training and they uh, qualify things like age qualifications, uh, criminal background qualifications, obviously they don't like you to have a criminal background, there's certain things that uh, exclude you if you have been convicted of certain felonies and violent crimes, you cannot get certified as a private security guard. They check your record and that sort of thing. Um, In-house security <clears throat> is not regulated by a board or any sort of entity like that. So a venue can um, provide its own security. They are not required to give those people any particular training, uh, which is a little bit scary, which is a little scary. Um, but they can basically do, you know, whatever they want to do. Hopefully they're going to be responsible and make sure their people are trained so that um, they don't do anything wrong. So each one of these entities also, they have their own set of, of responsibilities and duties. The police are there to enforce laws. So if you see police officers, say, at uh, the Superdome for a big concert or something, they are not going to get involved in um, maybe checking patrons' bags or taking tickets or checking passes for backstage. They are going to be there as a backup if somebody should break a law. Uh, and the private security or the in-house security would need some backup for that. Um, the private or in-house security are there to um, enforce the venue's rules and policies. So whatever that venue deems necessary to um, have a safe event, have a secure event, um, they can pretty much do. So a venue might for instance, um, not allow people things like, obvious things like you can't bring a weapon into the House of Blues or to a concert or something like that. Um, it may be something as simple as cameras. They prohibit cameras or large bags or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that in-house security or that private security is given the task of searching people to whatever extent they decide they want to. Um, it's, ra it's pretty rare that, that you would get um, actually searched, patted down for an event. Uh, the NFL is doing it. They mandated, mandated it for their football games, but I don't know of anybody else um, doing it too much. You might be asked to walk through, through a magnetometer or a metal detector or be wanded. Uh, I know House of Blues use, uses wands right now, and for some events at the Superdome, um, and certain types of concerts, they do use metal detectors uh, if they ex expect that people will likely be carrying weapons and, and that sort of thing. Um, we did a show at House of Blues not too long ago, and I don't know who the band was, but one of the things that they were searching for, which is a little, little, little unusual, was um, writing utensils. And apparently, whatever type of music this was or group this was, their crowd was known for uh, graffiti and writing, just writing on walls in the bathrooms, in the clubs, anywhere they could. So they were searching the people, and they were not allowed to even have a pencil um, taken into the venue. So that, that's a little bit unusual. But, um, and again, that can change. A band may have their own set of rules that they want the venue to enforce whether it's photography or, you know, it could be, it could be anything. And the venue can certainly um, enforce that any way they like. So in-house security, uh, the fact that there's no real regulation of it, training, I'm sure y'all heard of the incident a few years ago, New Year's Eve in the French Quarter and uh, some bouncers at a club uh, detained an in individual apparently for not uh, following their dress code and they ended up um, killing the guy. 
Uh, and I'm surprised we really haven't heard more lately, maybe we will soon, uh, about that because um, these were three guys that just took it upon themselves to uh, decide how they were going to enforce these rules. Um, and there are definitely lawsuits involved. I think the individuals are all being charged with some degree of murder. Uh, I'm sure the club is being sued f for whether or not they trained these individuals uh, and what kind of instructions they had, what kind of policies did the club have uh, for these guys to enforce rules. So that uh, is a bit of a loophole in the law. I have not seen much enforcement either of even the private security um, laws. They, they do require companies to be licensed and they do check on that, but um, I have never had anybody come to any of my events to check for certifications or licenses or anything like that. So it's very possible for uh, people to be out there um, providing the service that really don't know what they're doing. And that's, that is something to look for too. If you ever are in the situation where you've got to hire a security company or provide security, you're going to want to make sure the people you're dealing with are properly, properly licensed and certified. There's other loopholes such as for a special event. Um, you're not in fact required to be certified uh, as far as private security because it's considered a temporary employment. So um, there's certain paperwork that you do, but there's a lot of people out there working and they may or may not have been through um, very much training at all and certainly not the state required training. Other things to consider if, if for instance, you're in a situation where um, you're maybe managing a band or something and you have to secure personal security for somebody. You want to make sure that that person is well trained and you want to make sure you give them a certain set of guidelines to go by, how you want them to behave, um, you know, how far you want them to go and that sort of thing because uh, eventually if something happens all the parties involved potentially could be um, could be sued for liability. So. so when I go into a situation, whether it's I might be going into a new venue, uh, working on an event, or it may be something like the Jazz Fest, which is a large outdoor site, um, I have to just start collecting this information and figuring out what I'm going to do to secure it. And one of the big things is crowd control. Uh, the first questions you're going to ask are, how many people are we going to expect at this event? Um, you know, you have to know that, that to start planning something. If you're dealing with a venue, you might want to ask, you know, what's the capacity of the venue? How many tickets are you going to sell? Um, those are the first things you need to know um, in order to start planning for your security. You're going to want to know what your liabilities are. You're going to want to look around and say, in the case of an outdoor venue, um, what are the potential hazards that you have to deal with. You're responsible for, for providing a safe environment for the patrons that go there, for the performers that are there, and as well as the staff that are working there. So um, you have to look at, at all of that and you have to know that you are covered um, with, say, insurance. So if something does happen, you're not going to lose the shirt off your back because you don't have insurance and, and uh, just because you're not guilty of something doesn't mean that somebody can't sue you. So if you do get involved in a lawsuit, you do have to defend yourself and um, if you don't have insurance, that's going to that's gonna be a lot tougher. Uh, safety is a big issue. Looking around, again, hazards. What do I have to do to make this event safe? Uh, and that applies to every everywhere you go. I've kind of I, since I've been doing this for so long, I mean, everywhere I go, I look and I notice things like um, if doors are chained locked, um, locked, um, if there's stuff stacked up in hallways, just, you know, little basic everyday stuff, but it can make a big difference in the case of, of, you know, something bad happening. And it doesn't matter if it's a small venue or if it's a, you know, could be the Superdome. So, um, I have to figure out how to, pl I have to plan for emergencies. You always have to plan and have, um, uh, be ready for an emergency. You can think about, uh, try to think about all the things that could happen and then you have to be prepared for those things that you didn't think about and how you're going to apply your emergency plan 
so that it works for that situation as well. You have to look at any threats you might have. Unfortunately, in this day and age, we have to think about terrorism. And uh, terrorism isn't necessarily just that guy with a bomb on an airplane. It could be, um, you know, somebody that just wants to disrupt the event, cause panic, um, may or may not be out to hurt somebody, but um, just disrupt the event in general. You might have to deal with protesters. We've had protesters at Jazz Fest. It just, you know, you never know what the political climate is going on and have to be aware of that and know how to deal with it. Uh, bad weather is a threat for an outdoor event. You have to have a plan and be prepared for, um, for any bad weather. You have to be prepared for unhappy fans. Um, if something happens and people come into a show and something happened outside and they're not happy, that's going to change the whole, uh, the whole environment. So you have to be prepared for that. I also think about how people are going to be admitted to an event. Um, are there going to be lines building up outside? How many entrances am I going to need? Or how many entrances does a venue have? Uh, and are they providing so that, again, I want my fans to be happy. I don't want them showing up, standing outside in the rain, getting in late, that sort of thing. That's all things that um, you would be taking into consideration. I'm going to be looking at it, other secure areas. Do I need a secure backstage? Do I need dressing rooms? What amenities does the venue have? Or what amenities do I need to bring in so that I can provide all that stuff? And how am I going to secure that stuff? Do I need fencing um, uh, and, you know, numbers of security and, and all those types of things? And another thing that uh, everyone now has to be aware of is, is the venue or site accessible? Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, requires that uh, everything be accessible to everyone, whether they're in a wheelchair or have some other kind of disability. So that certainly is something that I have to be aware of when I go into a venue or plan a site. I have to make sure that it's accessible everywhere. Um, no matter what your role is, you might be a tour manager, you might be in a band, you might be a venue manager, uh, might be a small venue, it might be a big venue. Um, you're going to need to look at all these things and you can apply all these questions and all these uh, considerations to whatever it is you're doing to get the result that you want. So risk management is a big part of this and uh, it sort of sums up all of these questions. And risk management is the proactive discipline that deals with the possibility that some future event will cause harm and it gives you the framework to recognize and solve um, those, those situations. So you have to always be asking what, what can happen, what can go wrong, and what can I do to make sure it doesn't go wrong, and what will I do if it does still go wrong. So crowd management, again, crowd, crowd control, uh, planning for your crowd, knowing your crowd uh, can make or break your event or your show. Um, everybody has certain opinions about what types of music draws certain crowds. Um, actually, country music is one of the, draws one of the rowdiest crowds. So whenever a venue does a country show, a lot of times you'll have uh, uh, metal detectors put into place and that sort of thing. Uh, typically, rap is considered to be sort of a trouble-causing crowd. Um, whatever it happens to be, you need to know your crowd. Uh, if you're doing an event that has multiple artists, you might have a lot of different types of people all mixed together. So you have to be aware of who all those people are going to be, how they generally behave, so that you can be prepared if there's typically bad behavior in that crowd. What, what is it then about country music? I think I know, but what is it about country music that uh, increases the risk? I don't know. It's just the, the fans are a little rowdier. Maybe they tend to be uh, macho. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they drink more. Um, I, I mean, alcohol, <laughs> alcohol is always you know, a consideration in that, and mm -hmm. they, probably, um, they probably drink a lot. But, but uh, generally, um, venue managers don't really like country shows because they're more trouble than just about anything else. So the country music then that we've had at uh, Jazz Fest, has it 
And I, I haven't gotten to see it. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, think I think so far the country acts that we've had have not been, uh, first of all, there's not enough of them. Yeah. So the, that, the number of those people in the crowd, I think, has kind of been minimal. Mm -hmm. I think as we, you know, we're building on that and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it remains to be seen, but it's definitely something that is going to draw in a t an entirely different type of crowd for an mm -hmm. event that, you know, that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to depend on the numbers of mm -hmm. um, and the fact of those that people. It would be, uh, something, the fact that it would be a mixed, we have mixed audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, mixed uh, artists. So that uh, I'm thinking that because it wouldn't just be purely country or pure just rap or just whatever, uh, that may tend to um, spread the risk or, or lessen the risk. Right. It thins it out a little bit. Um, and an event like Jazz Fest, it's a very well known event. Uh, and the, a lot of people that go to Jazz Fest tend to go time and time again, regardless of what the, what the acts are. So um, a lot of people go for the event itself um, as opposed to particular people coming to see a particular group. But it is thinned out um, because there are so many different types of acts. Mm -hmm. And it's, we've been very lucky and the Jazz Fest has a reputation for being a very um, calm, laid back, secure event. There are, we rarely have fights or anything like that, even when we've brought in artists that maybe typically um, might do that. Even when we had, <coughs> who was the rap artist a couple of years ago when he was really late? Oh, mystical. mystical. And, uh, right. He was on that stage. Um, was that? He was on the other stage. Uh, was that the Dave Matthews? That wasn't the Dave Matthews day, was it? Um, but because he was real late, the, 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 uh, the crowds were back to back and you couldn't, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it was the Dave Matthews day. So it was a huge crowd. Um, People had gathered at one stage to see Mystical, and I think he was an hour <coughs> or two or something, something terrible. And again, luckily, the crowd was a typical Jazz Fest crowd. It was a mixed crowd, um, and they did get upset, but it didn't get to the point where they started fights or got rowdy or anything like that. But that's certainly a potential. Say he was doing a show at House of Blues or at the arena or something like that, there's much more potential for something bad happening um, if something like that does occur. So um, certainly doing shows on time is very important because, again, it gives potential for the crowd to, to get upset and get out of control. So. It was the case that the, uh, at Essence, this past Essence, when, when, I had, when we had uh, Chris Brown was late. Mm -hmm. He was late. He was supposed to be a main stage open or whatever. <clears throat> And I don't think we anticipated that that many people would come to see him. Or if that many people did, it would be early on the main floor. But because he was late, Mr. Flight, um, just to get him on, because so many people had showed up to uh, see him, they put him upstairs uh, where I was um, in one of the super lounges. And um, in Houston, th th that stadium is not necessarily confirmed. <coughs> like the Superdome, we have uh, uh, large lounges to put him in. So he was uh, put on that stage, and it got so thick, uh, there were young girls fainting, passing out, but the crowd was so thick, uh, as they fainted, they, there was no room for them to fall. So they had to kind of like pass them through the crowd to get them backstage. It, it really got out of hand, so. Yeah, it was, very, it was a very small space. The crowd wasn't big, but they were concentrated right in front of the stage, and uh, again, being flexible. I mean, that's certainly not anything that we anticipated. Yeah. Um, it's something that you always think about and have in the back of your mind, what would I do if, if that happened? And we ended up uh, stopping his show because we realized it was out of control. It was liable to just get worse. And we had to um, make sure that these people, you know, that nobody else got into a bad situation. So we stopped the show. We got the girls that were that had fainted or whatever out of the crowd, took them to the first aid, checked them out, everybody was fine. And uh, again, a lot of people weren't very happy because, and then the ones that had gone up there to see him uh, when we pulled the plug, but that was really you know, that the was only way to deal songs. with that. Yeah. So, and that was a situation where um, the talent was bigger than 
the space we had for them. But again, we had tried to make the best of a, of a, uh, of a bad situation, and in that case, it didn't work out that well. So, uh, Y'all may have heard of a um, terrible accident that happened in, back in 1979 at a Who concert in Cincinnati. Um, what happened was uh, it was a venue, uh, concert hall, um, I think they were, they didn't open the doors when they had planned to. It was a general admission show, so people knew that in order to get a good spot, they had to get there early. Uh, you know, there's no reserved seats or limitations on how many people could be on the floor and that sort of thing. So when they do, did open the doors, a lot of other things happened that turned it into a terrible accident, and I think um, 11 people actually died in that, and it was a, it was a crowd crush. Uh, they opened the doors, people pushed to get in, they didn't open all the doors, they didn't have enough doors open, so people were pushing against what they thought was going to be, you know, a door that was going to open, and it didn't. Um, they even apparently opened some doors and then closed them again. So whoever was in charge um, really had not planned well, they didn't know the crowd, um, they didn't know how they were going to react and how, you know, eager maybe they were going to be to get into that show. Uh, they didn't communicate with the crowd at all. They didn't let them know maybe that doors were opening late and why. So they were starting to get a little antsy and uh, frustrated. Um, that definitely had something to do with it. Um, so un unfortunately, sometimes it takes terrible accidents like that for people to sit down and figure out all the things that they should, um, that they should know about. Apparently that venue had had problems before, but it wasn't that serious, so they hadn't sat down and had a plan to figure out what to do. Maybe the people that managed the venue were not experienced with that particular type of crowd or large shows in general. So they really just didn't have uh, the resources they needed to make the decisions that they needed to make along the way that maybe could have stopped that from happening. Um, they could have done, you know, several things. They could have. Uh, first of all, opening the show late was, was a bad move, um, you know, opening more doors, that, all those kinds of things that they could have done, letting the crowd know what was going on could have alleviated that situation. There are some interesting um, reports uh, that you can find on the internet as well. I think crowdsafe.com. Uh, is a good website and safeconcerts.com and uh, they're really pretty interesting. They talk a lot about, um, uh, they have a lot of fan interaction. Uh, they have advice for people going to an event, what to be, you know, what to look out for and you can find these reports that there was a report done after this incident. Um, there were some other major reports done in Europe after some uh, European tragedies so they go in and they study all the things that went wrong and they talk about what, you, what they can do in the future to keep those things from happening again. In 2003, there were two events that happened th within three days of each other. I'm sure you all heard of the, um, the incident that happened in Rhode Island, a band called Great White, I believe. And uh, it was a very small venue. It was the capacity of the venue was only 300. It was just some club kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And the band had um, pyrotechnics set up on the stage. And they set the ceiling on fire. The club caught on fire. It spread really quickly. They, it was an older building. They did, weren't required to have a sprinkler system. And uh, again, people panicked when they realized they had to get out of there. They generally... Um, uh, the club, in fact, had plenty of exits. The exits were lit and marked and so on, but with the heavy smoke, you couldn't see the exit signs, and people were not familiar with the other exits. They just turned around and tried to go out the same way they had come in. So it ended up with um, a lot of people getting trampled. Oh, Ninety-something people got killed and out, of a, out of a club that only held 300, so um, that's pretty scary. Um, but again, looking at those, uh, looking at what happened, who was at fault. In that case, the band was found to be um, 
was found to be primarily at fault because they had not gotten the proper permits or even notified the club that they were going to use pyrotechnics. Uh, the club manager had said nobody had ever talked to him about it, and if they had, he would not have allowed them to do it um, for obvious reasons. So, um, so in that case, the band and their management was, was held responsible for that. So, again, doesn't seem like you might be, you know, responsible for uh, something like that, but everybody is, um, you know, you have to be aware of everything when you go into a venue. It's, it's your responsibility as well. Um, yeah. Would it be liable in a situation where it's just the crowd getting out of hand? Is that a security problem or management? Well, um, generally there's going to be a reason why they got out of hand. I mean, if just somebody started a fight or something like that, um, there was an incident not too long ago where um, it was in a dance hall and the um, DJ was having a problem with some, with some people, um, you know, getting rowdy or starting a fight or something. And he actually brought security over and told security to pepper spray them. And that caused a, whole, a panic because in a big, you know, bunch of people, if you pepper spray somebody, more than one person is going to get affected. So the people in the immediate area then panicked and trying to get away from it, um, they caused a, a crowd crush. So in that case, the DJ, first of all, should not have tried to tell security how to deal with it. Security should not have, they should have had their own means of dealing with something like that. Using pepper spray in a, in a crowd of people is not really a good idea. So maybe they weren't trained properly. And so again, that just exacerbated the whole situation. So whenever something happens, they're going to analyze every little thing and they're going to look at every person involved and they're going to try, try to spread the liability to as many people as they possibly can. So um, again, knowing what your risks are, planning for those risks are going to, you know, you're going to be covered in the end when something, you know, if something does happen, if you've done everything that you can possibly do um, to prevent that. So insurance and liability. Uh, again, you can be held liable. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, if you're working for somebody, they certainly have you covered with insurance. Uh, you want to make sure if you're working in a club or you're bringing, say you're bringing a, a group touring into a club, you wanna, you're going to want to make sure uh, that, they, that they are covered with insurance. So if something happens, uh, you're not left out in the cold and they can at least take financial responsibility for it. Another common lawsuit uh, that typically security get involved in uh, are, is excessive use of force. Um, and again, there are laws about excessive use of force and security officers that are trained, that's one of the things they're trained on. Um, and like the bouncers that killed the guy on Bourbon Street, they were using ex the excessive force. And they either didn't know better or um, or, it just, or they didn't care. My relationship with the festival is that they employ me. I have an employee relationship with them. So I am covered by workers' compensation insurance, their general liability insurance, mm -hmm. but it would be possible for me to be personally sued. If, if I was shown to be personally neg negligent, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, then yes, I could be personally sued. Now, if it was shown that um, somebody hired me and I was their employee or whatnot, they've got a certain amount of responsibility to make sure I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So if they put me in that position and I make a big mistake, they're, yeah, they're going to be held mostly liable and then whether it's showing that I um, uh, deliberately or vindictively or uh, you know, knew that what I was doing was going to cause harm mm -hmm. and didn't take all the measures that I possibly could, then yeah, I could be sued um, personally as well. And e even security guards, per uh, private security guards um, can be individually sued. So they are held responsible for their behavior. You can sue a police, you can sue a police officer, mm -hmm. um, you know, for his individual behavior. Yeah. So again, if you're, um, you know, guilty of not doing everything you can do, then definitely could possibly be sued. Uh, one of the other laws that private security um, needs to be aware of are 
uh, arrest laws and imprisonment um, detaining laws. Uh, private security people and in-house security cannot technically arrest somebody. Only law enforcement can do that. But they can make a citizen's arrest just like you or I could do walking down the street. But there's certain things that you need to know about that um, in order to do it properly. And if you don't do it properly or under the wrong circumstances, you can be charged with um, basically false imprisonment is what it is. If you detain somebody and like these guys, they were detaining this guy. When the police got there, they should have taken over the scene. They didn't. Um, so there's probably multiple charges involved in that, in that whole thing. Search and seizure laws are also really important. If you're going to be involved, you're going to be managing a venue, you're going to need to be familiar with search and seizure laws so that you know what your rights are as far as searching people coming into a venue, what type of things you can prohibit um, them from bringing into a venue, and how you go about doing searches. If you're searching bags, for instance, there's certain sort of typical rules that, that we follow, uh, like you don't put your hands inside somebody's bag. Uh, if you can't see the stuff in it, you get them to move it because the next thing you know, that person's missing their wallet and it, you know, they're sure it was the security guard that took their wallet out of their purse uh, to look in their bag. So you need to be familiar with those sorts of things. Um, and by the way, when these crowd crushes happen, um, what the people die from is uh, compressive asphyxia, which is just a pressure that stops you from breathing. So they're actually suffocating. And it only takes... <clears throat> if you're subjected to 300 pounds of pressure for two to three minutes, uh, basically your brain is starved of oxygen and uh, it can either cause death, I think, beyond, I think it takes about three minutes um, for it to kill you. And even if it's less than three minutes, you could certainly suffer um, brain damage and other physical problems. <clears throat> 